Uh, it's great to have you with us, uh, even during these times. It's great to have you with us for this final instalment of our free series. And I'm not going to lie, I have wondered at a number of levels uh, that this subject matter has come, become almost redundant in light of our current situation. It would seem, that, however, that over the last few weeks in, this, uh, in the stock market, uh, it has absolutely proof-texted the warning of Jesus about the pursuit of things over God. And I think we've learned, if we've learned nothing else about money over the past couple of weeks, we've learned about the risk of placing your well-being in the stock market or in your superannuation account. If you've missed the first three weeks of our series, be sure to go online and download them on the website. Quick recap of our last few weeks. Uh, week one, we talked about the idea of living in a mammon saturated culture, and we ask the question, do I have a money problem or do I have a mammon problem? The idea that money has a God-like status to produce joy, peace, or even security is a mammon problem, not a money problem. And boy, hasn't that way of thinking been exposed over what's happened over the last few days. If you think that all you own or somehow uh, everything you have is earned or deserved rather than bestowed or given by God. That's a mammon problem, not a money problem. And the kind of thinking, that kind of thinking's been exposed over the last few days as well. No one, not even the experts, can predict what your net worth will be tomorrow. The stock markets and the world economy has proof texted for us that financial security is mostly a myth, a contradiction in terms, if you like. If you think you can spend yourself or save yourself to happiness and peace, you've got a mammon problem, not a money problem. Two weeks ago, Bill elaborated on this with the concept that godliness with contentment is great gain, and he presented us with the idea that the antidote to greed is to become a generous person. And whilst this is much easier said than done, last week we looked at the rich history of the people of God in the art of generosity. And we looked at the practice of tithe or giving 10% of all income as a brilliant on-ramp to true, uh, true generosity. The idea that tithe is not so much a rule as an ancient practice of thanksgiving and an act of faith. We reinforced the idea with the statement that although Jesus endorsed the Pharisees giving of a tithe, Jesus never once told his followers to tithe. Not once did he say that. Uh, the cost was much higher than that. Jesus frequently asked and endorsed much more than 10%. We had Peter saying in Mark 10, 28, uh, we have left everything to follow you. And just before that, we have an interaction of Jesus with a wealthy man that ends like this. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go and sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. How is that? Mark explicitly tells us that Jesus loves this man. And though he tells him to go and sell everything he has and give it to, give it to the poor. How, why would you say that? to someone you love. And further to that, anyone who studies Jesus would have to acknowledge that Jesus loves his disciples especially much. He told them repeatedly that he loved them. And then as part of their mission in Matthew, Jesus does a similar thing. Jesus calls them to do this. Why would he do this? Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts, he says to the disciples. No bag for the journey, no extra shirt or sandals or staff for the worker is worth his keep. Absolute freefall. He pushes them off the end of the pier and watches them. Why? Why would he do that? Why could it be that Jesus wants those who follow him to learn dependence as part of discipleship? Could it be that risk is part of the way that Jesus develops faith? Again and again, Jesus pushes the limit on dependence. And just in case you're wondering how far he goes with the idea of free fall and risk and dependence, take a look at this. It's in all the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all have the same thing. 
Jesus makes this call, and he makes the call to anyone who wants to follow him. He says, calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he says to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Make no mistake. No one would have missed this. That was a call to come and die. That's what Jesus was saying. How can he love us and make that kind of call? The call to discipleship is inextricably bound to risk. There is no such thing as risk-free discipleship with Jesus. No such thing. But here in middle-class eastern suburbs Melbourne, we rarely, if ever, encounter real risk in our faith. It's a blessing and a curse, right? A blessing because I'd rather not be persecuted and hand, hounded for my faith. And a curse because in our comfort, many of us have simply forgotten our birthright. As followers of Jesus, we've got a long, long history of putting it all on the line for Jesus. It goes right back down through the ages. Nearly all of Jesus' disciples died a martyr's death. Paul, who was ultimately executed by the state for his faith, has an enormous list of risky situations that he endured. Here's one in 2 Corinthians 11. In my frequent journeys, I've been in danger from rivers, from bandits, in danger from my countrymen, from the Gentiles, in danger in the city and in the country, in danger on the sea and among false brothers. And that's just the beginning of the list. It goes on and on and on. He gets beaten and stoned and all sorts of things happen to him. Seriously, folks, risk is an inextricable part of growing faith. And there's just no way around it. Most of us love Jesus and we want to follow him. But in our lives, many of us haven't built the required muscle to endure risk. In comfy Middle Eastern suburbs, Melbourne, it's hard to build that kind of muscle. Let me ask you... What's the most significant risk that you've taken for your faith over the last 12 months? For some of you, it might be coming to church today. That might be the most significant risk you've taken for your faith. I don't know about you, but that's a, that's a really hard question to answer, isn't it? Because for us, actually, not much risk is required. I guarantee that the higher risk you've taken for your faith the more your faith will have grown because risk grows faith. There's just no way around it. There are two types of risk. Risk type one is a risk that is thrust upon us. I can't think of anything that would fit that category at the moment, really. Uh, I can't think of any risk that we're being thrust into at the moment that's through no choice of our own. Hmm, let me think about it. Of course, none of us can think of that uh, at the moment. Something like, say, a pandemic would fit that uh, bill, I would think. A risk beyond our control. Something we're thrust into through no choice of our own. And because risk potentially grows faith, this situation that we find ourselves in physically, financially and sociologically at the moment could be one of the greatest gifts to our faith. A very well-disguised gift but a gift nonetheless. Risk grows faith. What we know is that for the New Testament church, the moment risk was thrust upon them in the form of persecution, it was arguably the moment that they took off. It was the moment the movement actually took off. Risk grows faith. Have a think about it. If you graft your life with God alongside your levels of risk and pain, I guarantee the more comfortable and safe you are, the more likely you are to drift away from God. But the more heat and pressure that's, and risk that's in the mix, oddly enough, the closer we come to God. From relationship breakdown to losing your job, from health scares to financial challenges, from heartbreak to bankruptcy, risk grows faith. The risk that is thrust upon us develops faith through hardship. So that's the risk that's foisted upon us, right? That's that kind. It doesn't involve choice. It simply is about life catching up with us. 
Somehow when things go pear-shaped, we all tend to move towards God. And this current season, as devastating as it is for our world, our economy, and our health, this is where we as a church, we as followers of Christ, potentially come into our own. There is a profound freedom to be had when you fear nothing but God. It releases you from a whole range of other things to fear. This could be our moment. The second type of risk is far better and it's a far more interesting proposition than risk that is thrust upon us. The second type of risk is risk that we choose. And risk that we choose develops faith muscle through the choices we make. It's one thing to be forced to take up your cross. It's a whole other thing to take it up willingly. So if risk grows faith, then in middle class Australia, unless we choose it for ourselves, we can grow fat and lazy in our faith. And subsequently, when risk number one hits us, when risk is thrust upon us, many of us can lack the muscle to endure it. I've got no doubt that this pandemic and what it does to our economy and our community will cost some people their faith during the coming months. It'll just be too much for them. Without the muscle to endure, we're more likely to collapse under the weight of uninvited crisis. I don't know about you, but I don't want to survive this crisis. I want to thrive through it. Wouldn't it be awesome if we came out of this thing uh, stronger than ever in our faith, in our love and connection with Jesus, and in our love and connection with one another? The question I've got for you this morning is, how can we be free to thrive in the midst of high-level risk? Well, in order to grow faith, Jesus said to the rich man, go and sell everything you have. And for the same reasons, he said to his disciples, take nothing on the journey with you. So what's his invitation to us? Jesus is a lot of things, but safe is not one of them. And if you want to read a fabulous text about how to take risks for Jesus financially, have a great read of uh, 2 Corinthians 8. It's a brilliant story of God's people taking huge risks to bless others. I was going to preach on that this weekend. So I was going to actually share a little bit about that story uh, today. I had some fabulous st stories to share as well along with that took several attempts at trying to write that sermon before I was able to hear God's invitation to leave it. And I've got to tell you, I was sorely tempted to make this me message about money. The whole series has been about being free from the grip of money. And I'd love to tell you that I'm free of that. I'd love to tell you that I don't think or worry about that. But that would not be true. At the moment, uh, our giving at Sindel is not even close to where it needs to be to move forward. On our current trajectory, we can't fix the heating or cooling here in the West. Mind you, that's just become a non-issue over the next couple of weeks. We're paying our bills, but ultimately, if we don't pick up, we'll struggle to pay our staff both here and at Sindel and abroad on mission. When you put that overlay with the overlay of the pandemic, we're heading into, and uh, the fact that a third of our offerings come in via Sunday services, which we're just about to shut down, this on top of huge losses of our people who are experiencing losses in their businesses and superannuation, whichever way you do it, whichever way you skin it, as a community, we face an impossible task financially over the next few months. We do. Utterly impossible. I'm not going to lie. I was feeling pretty shrill about that on Friday. We've got staff. We've got ministries and mission that depend on our finances to move forward. And I feel the responsibility of that acutely. I was sharing this with Jesus every day this week and was super shrill by Friday, really squealy. And at some point... Jesus reminded me 
of my own sermons, which was kind of him. He reminded me that he is the source. He's the source. Not money, and certainly not me. Not only did he remind me of that, but he forbid me from trying to manipulate you with some awesome story of generosity in 2 Corinthians 8. It's a great story, but apparently it's not what you needed to hear this morning. Maybe that's a story for when we're smashing it financially. I want to make this statement, and it costs me to say it as we head over the cliff into the next season. I said it before, and now I'm saying it again. God does not need your money. He, needs, he wants your heart. I'm not interested in your money. He wants your heart. And as we shall see when God gets hold of our hearts, money becomes an irrelevance. The text that Jesus brought before me on Friday uh, after rebuking me was from Acts 4. And you'll be really familiar with it. At the beginning of Acts 4, the church is smashing it out of the park. They're doing really well. And just as they're starting to get traction, this happens. The priests... And the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees, these are all the religious bosses. They come to Peter and John whilst they're preaching to the people. And they're greatly disturbed because these apostles are uh, teaching the people and they're proclaiming Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. So they seize Peter and John because it's evening and they put them in jail until the next day. So that's mildly problematic, right? The stars of the show, the beginning of the movement, these guys who are pivotal to the beginning of the movement get locked up. And they're about to get pasted by the smartest theological minds in the land. So the next day, the religious leaders get Peter and John in front of the crowd and they want to humiliate them. And they ask a really interesting question of Peter and John. They say, by what power... And what name did you do this? This is the question they ask. Because they've seen something and they think it's actually spectacular, but they can't explain it. Then it says in the very next sentence, it says, Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. So that's the power right there. And the next few verses down, Peter says this. He says, uh, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who you crucified, but who God raised from the dead, that this man stands beside you healed. Any questions, anyone? Basically, it's like, really, look at the scoreboard, boys and girls. This is, we're winning. And it's by Jesus that we're winning. Uh, the power of the Holy Spirit, really, and the name of Jesus Christ are unbeatable in the hands of the willing. And so these men who are wanting to persecute and pay out on these fishermen find themselves utterly befuddled by how smart these guys are, how courageous they are, and how powerful they are. So they want to know, how do you do it? But this isn't where the story ends. The leaders, uh, just at the end, they, have nothing, they can't really do anything about these guys, so they threaten them and bully them. And then they forbid the disciples from speaking any further about Jesus. That's a pretty big thing to say. And these guys are not making empty threats. The threat is high. These are the same people that put Jesus on the cross. They carry out their threats. They have a track record in doing so. And they are, they are mean, they are vicious, and they are violent if you cross them. So this is a real threat. And they say, you better stop talking about Jesus in public. So Peter and John go back to the believers, their church, if you like, and they tell them what happened. So they tell them everything that happened, including the threats. They're saying, these guys are going to kill us. They're coming after us if we, don't stop speaking about, if we don't stop speaking about Jesus. So essentially, they say to the church, we've been forbidden from sharing any more about Jesus. They've told us to shut it down. It's not good news for anyone. So have a look at how the early church responds to the threat. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. That's their response. Not when they heard this, they formed a protest group and began to lobby for change. Not 
When they heard this, they formed a contingency for security around Peter and John. Not when they heard this, they shipped John and Peter off to a safer location. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. That's what they did. At its best, that's what high-risk environment can do for the people of God. And at its best, that's where the people of God can find freedom from that which they fear. So when the stock market goes belly up and we're faced with a choice, we can choose to try and lower our risk by running around trying to predict what's going to happen next, or we can raise our voices to God. So when the health risks of COVID-19 pandemic threaten us, we can try to lower our risk by panic buying toilet paper, I don't know, or we can raise our voices to God. When we worry about whether we're going to Keep our jobs with the looming economic crisis. We can run around trying to shore things up and trying to make it happen, or we can raise our voices to God. Next week, when you meet in each other's homes, make time to raise your voices to God together. Makes a massive difference. Makes a massive difference for you. It will make a massive difference for us as a church. It will make a massive difference for anyone we interact with over the coming weeks. Raise our voices to God. Our role as Christians in a panicked and fearful society is not to join in, not to jump on the queue for toilet paper at the supermarket, but to find our peace in God. Look at how the early church framed their God. They said, Sovereign Lord, you make the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. So they don't start with their request. They actually start with who God is. They remember God in his rightful place. And that brings everything else into context. When we raise our voices to God, we remember who he is in the context of our situation. We are in a global pandemic. God is sovereign. God is overall. There's a looming financial crisis. God is sovereign. God is overall. We don't know where it's all going to end. God is sovereign. God is overall. There are threats to our health, to our family, threats to our friends, our finances, our plans, threats to our employment. God is sovereign. God is overall. Don't you love that idea? None of this caught God off guard. None of it has surprised him or blindsided him. No matter what happens, God can use this situation and will use this situation for good. God is sovereign. God is overall. Next in their prayer, the early church specifically lay out the threat before God and the name, and they name the precedent. Uh, of Jesus, even when evil looked like it was reigning supreme. They talk about uh, Jesus, even though they killed him, he came back from the dead. God is sovereign. God is over the all. Then finally, in verse 29, the, the church come to their request. And this is what they request. The request is one that I want us to make this morning. So let's pay attention. So their request is, Now, Lord, consider their threats. And enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus Christ. It's another way of saying this. God, give us all we need to boldly meet the challenge in front of us. They're not saying, oh, make it go away. They're saying, let us meet it. Give us what we need to meet it. And that's where we're going to land today. This is a word for me, and I'm almost certain it's a word for you. Lord, give us all we need to boldly meet the challenge. You go to work on Monday and they're talking layoffs. Lord, give us all we need to boldly meet the challenge. You look at your super and wonder if you're going to have enough. Lord, give us all we need to boldly meet the challenge. We look at our gatherings decimated by a disease that we can't control. Lord, give us all we need to boldly meet the challenge. 
Maybe you're looking at your own finances like I'm looking at Sindel's finances right now and you're wondering how on earth you're going to make ends meet. Lord, give us all we need to boldly meet the challenge. After they pray this prayer, Acts 4.31 tells us that after they prayed, the place uh, where they're meeting shaken and they're all filled with the Holy Spirit and they speak the word of God boldly. Not only that, if you keep reading, God doesn't just meet their prayer request, he surpasses it. Have a look at at, at this, and we're going to end on it. Uh, All believers were in one in heart and in mind. No one claimed any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. Look at this last sentence, that there was no needy person among them. That's a big statement. So what begins as a disaster in the hands of God becomes an awesome opportunity. Not only does God use the crisis to grow the faith of the early church, but he uses the disaster to grow their influence and their reach as well. You know, God's got a happy knack of bringing great things from crisis. He's done it before. The threat is an invitation for the people of God to step up. And I only got one thing to say, left to say in the current crisis that's upon us. God's done this before and he can do it again. You believe that this morning? He can do this again. He can. He can do it again. And I really believe he will. This morning I want us to ask him to do it again. And do it through his Holy Spirit in us. Imagine if he gets hold of us. Imagine if Sindel House Church surpasses Sindel Baptist Church. Imagine if he gets hold of us. No one is left unconnected. Imagine if he gets hold of us and there was no needy person among them. Imagine that. He's done it before and he can do it again. You know, as we face this crisis coming over the horizon, I would love for us to ask God to do something extraordinary through us and to us in this season. He's done it before and he can do it again. If you want to be part of this, in this last meeting uh, we've got, I'd love it if you'd like to join me in asking as we head into this season. I would love for you to join me in asking him to do it again. And let's start with do it in me. Let's start there. Uh, So if you're able to, I'd love it if you just stand up where you are as a way of saying to God, not to me, to God, do it in me. And if you're not able to stand, just signal with your hand. And let's do it now. Let's just stand right now where we are and let's stand together and ask God to give us all we need to boldly meet the challenges ahead of us. Let's do that right now. Let's pray. So, Lord, we ask for you to meet us where we're at right now. And we give you our fears, fears about health, fears about finance, fears about future. Just bring him whatever you have as a fear right now. Just bring that before him, whatever's on your heart and on your mind. Just bring it before him. Now, Lord, we ask not that you take this away, but we ask that you would give us all we need to meet the challenges ahead. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit to enable us to meet 
the challenges in front of us. Now ask God, just in your hearts, to fill you with his Holy Spirit. And ask for him to fill our community afresh as well. Lord, so many times you've given your people an extra measure of your Holy Spirit to meet the crisis in front of them. And we ask that you would do that for us over the coming weeks and months. <clears throat> that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit for ourselves, for our families, for our communities, for our work colleagues. We ask for an extra measure of your Holy Spirit full and running over to empower us, to give us wisdom, to give us clarity and to give us courage. Lord, we commit ourselves afresh to you today. You are sovereign over all. Help us not to forget that in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.